Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at geologic time. So in this video we're going to focus on how do we reconstruct geologic histories and this is going to correspond to section 9.13 of your textbook. So we've already discussed how we can use relative dating to put the rocks that we see in an area into a chronological sequence. So we can use the principle of superposition, the principle of original horizontality, the principle of cross-cutting relationships, the principle of inclusions, and the principle of baked contacts to help us work out the order in which layers of rock or rocks were formed in an area. Now, the next thing we need to think about is how do we use this information to produce a geologic history? So in terms of producing a geologic history for an area, what we'll do is we will literally work through our sequence of rocks one by one, working out exactly how each of these layers were formed. So, for instance, as we, uh, as we, if we look at this sequence here, we could say, right, this layer here appears to be a conglomerate. Well, conglomerates tend to be associated with periods of erosion, so that would suggest that when this layer was being deposited, we probably have a situation where we have an, a, a period of exposure, so that our rock is above sea level, it's being actively eroded in a high energy environment, and this leads to the formation of a conglomerate. So maybe it's part of a mountain range. Now, above that, you can see we have this uh, pink colored layer, which appears to be a sandstone. Well, red colored sandstones tend to be associated with desert conditions. So that would suggest that there's clearly been a change of environment from a uh, more mountainous uh, terrain. And the area has now become flatter and hotter and drier, and it's now been replaced by a desert environment. So then over the top of this sandstone, we have this gray unit here, which appears to be uh, a mudstone of some kind. So there are lots of ways in which we could form mudstones. But for this particular model, what I'm going to suggest is that maybe it was deposited as part of a fluvial system. So maybe this mudstone actually represents floodplain sediments. And so what seems to have happened is our desert seems to have now been covered over by a river system, which is occasionally flooding and depositing layers of mud. So on top of uh, our muddy sediment here, we appear to have a, a mixture of a sandy muddy sediment marked out by this yellow rock. Well, there are lots of ways in which we can form sandy muddy sediments. So, you know, this could be something like the sediments which are part of the river channels, which ended up forming the floodplain muds. Or it could possibly be that there's been some kind of rise in sea level. The area has been inundated and this area is now part of the continental shelf. So maybe it's in the marine environment. Then above that layer of sandy mudstone, you can see we have what appears to be a breccia uh, horizon. This uh, would normally suggest that we are now back in a mountainous uh, environment because breccias tend to be associated with landslide deposits. So that would suggest elevated terrain. And then we're back into another red sandstone here that would suggest that whatever elevated terrain there was has been eroded away. And now we've moved to an environment where we have a desert plain once again. So you can see that by working our way up through our stratigraphic column and working out how each layer of rock could have formed, we end up producing a vertical geologic history for this location only. OK, that's very important. The geologic history that we've come up for this location may not be repeated at other locations. So if we look at our second location here, you can see that our sequence of rocks isn't exactly the same. You can see, for instance, that we have gained an additional unit. So clearly during this period of time right here, something different was occurring at this location compared to this location. And so this has resulted in a different sequence of rocks. So each geologic history is uh, appropriate only to the location where you are looking at the rocks. As soon as you move to another location, you obviously have to produce a new geologic history. Now, what we'll need to do when we compare rocks in two different locations is we'll obviously want to correlate between the layers of rock. Now, if there are fossils present, we've already discussed how we can do that. And fossils are arguably the most straightforward method of correlating between layers of rock. But not every rock is going to contain fossils. So sometimes we have to use other methods of correlation. 
So the first thing we can do is we can use the rock type to correlate between different layers. Now, to be clear, most of the time using the rock type isn't actually that helpful. So, for instance, if we were to try and correlate this mud here with another muddy sediment at a different location, well, that's going to be nearly impossible because mudstones are extremely common. And so you will never be able to work out which mudstone at our second location cor uh, corresponds to this mudstone right here. You can only use rock types to correlate between uh, layers of rock at different locations if the rock type is very specific, if there's something about it that makes it stand out. So for instance, a classic example would be something like a black limestone. So this is a limestone that forms in environments where we have um, a carbonate shelf, so a, a carbonate lagoon, which is obviously going to produce large quantities of calcium carbonate, but it's also an environment where we have a large amount of organic material being added to the sediment. So we have lots and lots of dead plant life and lots and lots of dead uh, single-celled photosynthesizing organisms being incorporated into that carbonate sediment. And this causes the amount of carbon in that carbonate sediment to be increased. And that results in a dark black, dark gray to black colored limestone. And so these black limestones are rather distinct and they're not that common. And so if we were to have, for argument's sake, let's say this yellow layer here represents a black limestone. And therefore we go to our next location and we see another black limestone here. Well, chances are it's the same layer of rock because black limestones aren't that common. And so you can say, right, this layer correlates to this layer. Is there anything else we can do? Well, yeah, we can use the position of the rocks in the sequence to try and work out whether they match. So if we look at our sequence here, you can see we have a, uh, a red sandstone here, followed by a gray mudstone, followed by a yellow sandy mudstone, followed by a breccia, followed by another red sandstone. If we go to our second location, we have red sandstone followed by mudstone, followed by sandy mudstone, followed by breccia, followed by red sandstone. So you can see we have the same sequence of rocks at the diff at different locations. And so because we have this same sequence, obviously in the same order, we can say, right, this layer correlates to that layer, that layer to that layer, this one to this one, this one to this one, and this one to this one. Now, obviously, as we've discussed, Fossils, extremely helpful when it comes to correlating layers. Numeric ages are also helpful. Let's say, for instance, there is a lava flow. Once again, let's say that this yellow layer actually represents a lava flow. Well, if we date the lava flow at this location and we find it dates to 200 million years ago, and we date the lava flow at this location and we find it dates to 200 million years ago, we'll, we can say with a reasonable amount of certainty that what we're looking at is the same rock. So we're looking at the same lava flow. And so we would correlate those units together. Now, the final thing we can try and use is something which is referred to as the magnetic sequence. So we know that the Earth's poles will sporadically flip. So at the moment, north is north and south is south. However, every once in a while, the Earth's poles will flip and the South Pole will become the North Pole and the North Pole will become the South Pole. Now, these magnetic flips can be preserved within the minerals of certain rocks. And so what we can do is we can look at these magnetic flips and when they occur, and we can try and link them together between different areas. So we'll look for, let's say, um, let's say the polarity of the Earth's magnetic field uh, for this layer of rock is normal, and we also see a normal polarity over here, then there's a flip. And so for this mudstone, we have minerals that show a reversed magnetic field. We also see the same thing over here in this mudstone. Then we come back up to this, uh, this sandy mudstone here, and let's say this one now has a normal magnetic field, so north is north and south is south. However, this muddy sandstone here still has a reversed magnetic field, which would mean north is south and south is north. Now, obviously, that would mean then that the magnetic sequence for these two locations is different. And as such, we would not be able to correlate these layers of rock because clearly they formed at different times. And so we can use the magnetic sequence to you know, work out where rocks correlate or don't correlate together.
Now, this analysis is what we refer to as a vertical stratigraphic analysis. So we're going up the stratigraphic common, column, picking up one layer at a time, analyzing it, working out how it formed, then trying to correlate it to uh, other outcrops at different locations. Now, the other thing we need to concern ourselves with is what happens to our layers of rock laterally. So when you think of a layer of sedimentary rock, it does not continue forever. Eventually, our layer of sedimentary rock will transition into a new type of sedimentary rock. So the question is, is why is that? Well, this is because of lateral relationships. So if we look at this diagram here, you can see we have a continent right here. We have a coastline here and we have an ocean basin right here, more accurately, a continental shelf. Now, we can see that on the continents, we have uh, a few different environments. We have a, an area of a topographic high over here, so mountainous terrain. We have a river system, a fluvial network right here. We have a desert system right here. And then we have a coastal system containing a delta right here. And then we have a continental shelf environment right here, so a marine environment. Now, if we were to look at a layer of sediment that's being deposited at the same time across this entire sequence, what would we see? So imagine that we have sedimentary deposition occurring in all of these locations at the same time. Now, if we were to follow that layer of sediment, it would not be the same all the way along because the layer of sediment would obviously change based on the environment in which it was being deposited. So if we were to start over here, our layer of sediment would initially probably start off as a breccia. So quite a coarse grained angular clastic sedimentary rock. Now, as we progress from our area of topographic, from our topographically high area onto our floodplain, we're going to see our breccia will slowly transition into a mudstone. And as we continue across our mudstone, we're eventually going to hit our river channel. So we're suddenly going to see a sandstone appear. Then we're going to come back out the other side and then we're going to be back into mudstones. Now, we're then going to steadily see our mudstone layer will transition into a desert sandstone, which represents our sand dune environment. Our desert sandstone is then going to continue across until it begins to change into a coastal sediment, and eventually it will then change into the type of sediment we find associated with deltas. And then as we exit the delta, we're then going to go into the continental shelf environment. So we're initially going to see sandstones followed by mudstones, and then if conditions are right, limestone. Stones. Now, what we're discussing is a layer of rock that's forming at the same time. And so the layer of rock is continuous and it has the same age. However, because this layer of rock is you know, essentially forming in several different environments simultaneously, each environment essentially imparts its own distinct uh, stamp onto the sediment that's being deposited. And this produces essentially a layer which is constantly changing the type of rock that it has as it moves from one loca as it moves to one environment to another. So our layer will have multiple different fascias in it. And we'll see these fascias transitioning as we move along laterally through our layer. So when we do our analysis of a, an area for geologic history, we not only have to think about how the area is changing vertically, but we also have to think about how the area is changing laterally. So if we just go back to the previous slide for one second, when we're looking at this idea, when we're looking at this uh, stratigraphic column, what we're looking at are changes which are occurring as we move up through the sequence, as the layers of rock are getting younger. In the case of a lateral fascist relationship, what we're looking at is we're looking at a layer of sedimentary rock which has a consistent age. The age isn't changing. However, as we move along our layer of sediment and the sedimentary rock that forms from it, what we're seeing is a steady change in the sedimentary rock as we transition from one environment to another. And so we have to bear this in mind, we're going to be looking at different things depending on how we're analysing our area. If we're doing a vertical analysis, we're going to be looking at essentially how the area is developing over time. If we're looking at a lateral relationship, we're not going to be worried about how it's evolving over time. We're going to be worried about how it's evolving laterally. And so when you combine these two different approaches together, essentially it allows you to build up a geologic history for your area and so that will help to explain what has happened with regards to deformation, volcanic processes um, and the you know, deposition of sediment. All right, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.